Yes, now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we joyfully celebrate the solemnity of the Holy Family of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Every family is a small society, and indeed the most beautiful of all societies. A society, we know, is the gathering of several people united by the bonds of a common nature and directed by a hierarchy. In families, this aggregation is not fortuitous. It is the blossoming of several lives on a single stem, resulting in a hierarchy of order, in which this blossoming has its root and trunk, branches and flowers, all vivified by the same sun which nourishes them. A religious community enjoys the same unity, but not based on nature, but on grace and divine choice. A religious community is a true spiritual, supernatural family formed by God through what is called vocation. Unity is the great strength of the family. In order to preserve and strengthen this union, God disposes in each one of its members an instinct of proximity, which is called paternal or fraternal love. Unfortunately, often as family members grow in number and the personality of each member develops, common interests are sometimes replaced by personal interests, which divide the family. Selfishness is therefore the great enemy of family union. This selfishness disingrates this primitive center, forming separate unions. Other elements of this unity spring from this dominant element. These are divergences of ideas, tastes, characters, and habits. We must add to these elements the defects of each person, personal defects which we can diminish by our effort, those of others, which sometimes we maliciously exaggerate. This is the disunity of union, struggle instead of peace, disgust instead of happiness. If only we knew to turn away from the family this terrible and disastrous selfishness. If only we knew how to place above our own spirit personal interests, those of our family. Today's family society would not be facing a crisis which seems almost irreparable, which is overwhelming and which is not easy to solve. We have come to know the evil. Let us now contemplate its ideal beauty, the family which has been able to completely avoid these evils and to keep it as a model for all our families and for all its members. Knowing that the foundation of the family and what is other possible evils, the risks who threaten it, it will be able for, easily for us to analyze the sublime teaching given to us by the Holy Family, reducing everything to the following three points. The same ideas, the same preferences, and the same character. Let us first consider the ideas. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had the same ideas about all things. They drew them from one and only source of truth, wisdom, and justice, from God, who was their light and their guide. The concordance of religious ideas among the members of a family is a determining factor of union and peace. Secondary divergences are attenuated under the influence of religious ideas, while their divergence in religious ideas is a perennial source of bitterness and suffering. The preferences. Conformity of preferences is another source of unity. In Nazareth, the tastes and preferences of Mary and Joseph were those of Jesus. Our tastes depend less on us than our ideas. 
since the ideas come from study, reflection and the environment, while the tastes are a result of one's temperament. It is not so much dependent on us to dislike such or such a taste of our own, but what is dependent on us is to order our tastes and preferences according to sound reason and divine revelation, and so little by little modifying it. It is not possible to destroy our natural tastes, but it is necessary to sacrifice it at some times for the good of others and also for the good of our own soul. Wishing others to adopt our tastes is often dangerous. It may even be sometimes disastrous. But to follow the tastes and wishes of others is prudent and often virtuous as long as these are not sinful. Let us now consider the question of character. What we said about tastes can also be said about character. There is, however, a difference. A character can have defects and every defect is an evil. Such an evil is the enemy of the union of hearts. Therefore, it must be corrected. These defects are, for example, loveliness, rudeness, bad temper, rancor, the spirit of contradiction, susceptibility, stubbornness, lack of delicacy, order and punctuality. It is the long list of human miseries. None of these things existed in the holy house of Nazareth. There one lived for the other. Each one tried to please the others. The character was the same for all three, goodness and dedication. If someone had asked Mary or Joseph what they wanted, they would have answered, to please Jesus. And if they had answered Jesus the same thing, he would have answered, to please Mary and Joseph. A prolonged contemplation of the Holy Family in Nazareth can teach us much. This enchanting vision will instill in us the desire to imitate <laughs> this life dedicated to others. It is impossible to imagine Mary or Joseph looking just after their own business, their after their only, only their, their own personal concerns, and not those of Jesus. Forgotten of themselves, their only occupation was to bring their spirit, hearts and eyes, always attentive to the smallest desires or needs of the others. To live only for yourself is to narrow down and become small. To live for others is to widen, to become great. Let us meditate from time to time on the gentle life, this cloudless union, the mutual dedication, of Jesus, Mary and Joseph at Nazareth, and little by little we will feel the need to imitate these beautiful examples, seeking to sow around us dedication and joy, the fruit of the union of hearts, which must reign in every natural or spiritual family. The Acts of the Apostles in a divine phrase outline the vocation of families and communities when they told of the first Christian who formed a heart and one soul. This word sums up admirably the family life of Nazareth. The heart of each one of the members of the Holy Family belonged to the others through their affection. Let us meditate briefly on this feature of union considering its external exercise and its inner source. Contemplating the little house of Nazareth, we see it shining despite its poverty, burning of charity despite the nakedness of its walls, sweet and smiling affections radiating from every corner, keeping among its happy inhabitants a sweet and gentle joy. Let us now live for the moment in our mind Bethlehem, let us leave the first years and consider Jesus as a teenager, as a young man, when his personality begins to stand out. 
He was submissive to them, says the Gospel, from which it must be concluded that Mary and Joseph commanded him, instructed him, formed him. Jesus had to learn everything, like every little child, who knows nothing and is instructed by its parents. In fact, in his little human brain, work was being done, experimental science was being developed, as it is the case with all children. Of course, Jesus knew everything through his divine nature, but he acquired experimentally in his human nature what he already knew divinely. The action of Mary and Joseph was not a mere appearance, and the application of Jesus to learn was not a complacent simulation. His human progress was real, from which the holy spouses drew new joys and the child Jesus received new expressions <coughs> of gratitude for every teaching received. And what was the inner source of this holy family? Affection among the members of the holy family is not the only fact. It is a model to be imitated. Jesus wanted to live in all his rigor the condition of every man coming into this world, and he did not separate himself from the hardships of this common life. He bowed down with respect to Mary and Joseph, being submissive to them in everything. But if the adoration of these two great souls was not manifested outwardly in genuflections or other gestures, it was a continuous inner attitude. All their feelings and actions were inspired by this spirit of respect and adoration. In the person of Jesus, they saw God. Let us contemplate Jesus helping Mary in the domestic works, with what grace he sought to avoid his mother's fatigue and to render her services by sweeping, stirring up the fire, preparing firewood. Let us follow him in Joseph's workshop, where he wants to learn the use of every tool, making some informative trials at the beginning and then more perfect in the course of time. It is easy to represent one another's attitude. There was never the slightest disagreement. They lived on the same thoughts and the same feelings. Never a disaccord could be seen. There was never the slightest disagreement. All lived on the same thoughts and the same feelings. The reason is simple. The three persons composing this holy family, this earthly trinity, were perfect. Never a forgetfulness, a lack of attention. They love each other so much. Each one dreams of the other one, lives for the other one. Such is the sweet affection which surrounded the Holy Family. Mutual love replaced selfishness in these righteous hearts. It is a model for us to be reproduced, if not with the same perfection at Nazareth, at least with the effort of every day. To achieve this union, this mutual love in our own families, two conditions are necessary. Everyone should try to be more attentive, more affectionate towards the others, and to see and love Jesus in each member of the family. Such love, even if natural in itself, is supernaturalized by the mystical presence of Jesus and will be solid, lasting, and a source of happiness in families. Let us ask confidently each member of the Holy Family and all three together to obtain us an ardent supernatural love and dedication to the members of our natural and social families so that we may support one another in the way of sanctification. May the holy names of Jesus, Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever. Amen. In the name of the Father,